During our class videos, you may hear our poets and playwrights use terms that are new to you. We have created a list of key terms and definitions that you can refer to at any point during our video lectures. This list is available on the Videos and Readings class page, where you can read it or download it as a PDF. If you would like to find and review these terms while you watch each class video, you can stop this video, go back to the Videos and Readings class page, and download the PDF. There you can play this video in each of the following class videos. If you have any questions about these terms, we encourage you to ask your teaching team in the weekly class discussions. Kai Miller is a Jamaican essayist, poet, and novelist. He has written 10 books, including The Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion, L'Authentique Perline Porius, Writing Down the Vision, Essays, and Prophecies, and most recently, a novel titled August Town. He has been shortlisted for numerous prizes, including the Commonwealth Writers First Book Prize, the Dylan Thomas Prize, and the John Llewellyn Reese Prize. And he has won the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature and the 2014 Forward Prize for Poetry. He was a 2007 resident at the International Writing Program and has taught at York University, the University of Glasgow, and Royal Holloway University of London. He currently teaches English at the University of Exeter. All right, so I'm, I'm Kai Miller. I'm a writer of all kinds of things, um, of fiction, of nonfiction, essays, and poetry. Uh, I'm a professor of creative writing in the UK at University of Exeter. Uh, but, but I think probably the genre that draws me the most is poetry. So I'll talk about poetry. I think my work is, is by nature political. Um, but I don't know if I am drawn to a social issue or drawn to write about it. Uh, I think I'm drawn to language, and I think language is political. Um, there's there's a great line by Walcott: "No language is neutral," and I think if I think the very nature of thinking about thinking about that, thinking about the words that you use, thinking about um, who can hear those words and who can't hear those words, the minute you begin thinking like that, you are your work becomes steeped in politics. Um, if you begin to shape those words based again on who who might hear them and who might not hear them or willing people to hear what you are saying in the way that you're saying it, um, the poem increasingly becomes a political act. Um, and I think I think that's why I'm political. it's 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 the language, it's the choice of language that um, I don't know, lights a fire underneath the poem. Um, so, so yeah, so, so, so I think my work becomes political because it is, it is conscious of, of its language. And in that way, I think perhaps all poems are political in a way. So my last book of poems is um, was a book called The Cartographer Tries to Map Away to Zion. And I'll tell you the idea behind the poems, which I guess, you know, is, is insanely political. Um, so I was looking at some maps of early Jamaica, and perhaps the most interesting thing about a map is not what is on the map, but what's not on the map. So why didn't the cartographer see this village, or why didn't he see that road? Were the people who inhabited that village or were the people who used that road too, import, too unimportant for him to see? And so how do you write a collection that shows what is not included on a map? So that's the whole idea of the poem. It imagines a cartographer um, coming to my own country, Jamaica, to map the roads and he ends up in a very contentious conversation about maps and about map making. But the whole book is about language. I mean, map making in that sense is always a metaphor. And so the poem begins with, um, with a poem called Establishing the Meter, which is a, a very true thing that happens. So in um, kind of mid, 
uh, kind of during the end of the French Revolution, two French cartographers decide to do an amazing thing. They are going to map the world. They're going to measure the world. And from this measurement, so they're going to measure the circumference of the of the Earth, and one I think the I think the unit is one forty millionth or one four hundred millionth of that is going to be a new meter. It's going to be a new measurement, and it's going to be called the meter. And so the poem begins with a, this poem called "Establishing the Meter." Again, it's clearly a metaphor, um, and in that I'm thinking about who established the meter. Um, and why did that meter become universal? How did this new way of measuring displace other local ways of measuring? Um, and so the whole book is concerned with that, concerned with what is the... <clears throat> do, we, do we write poems always in iambic pentameter or in another meter? Was there a meter that was local that we don't write in, we don't write in anymore because a universal way of writing superseded that and so so the measurement of poetry what we think as valid um that's always political and so uh i don't know if that's a small example of um language or the way that we we measure poetry or speak poetry um that those things can become political very quickly um, and, and of course, we're talking about political with a kind of common P, not necessarily about governments. But I, <clears throat> I guess when it, when I talk about uh, poetry being political, is that I'm concerned um, with ideas of power and who has power and who has been disempowered. Um, so disempowered by by language, not necessarily by government, disempowered by all kinds of processes. Um, so it's a much broader idea of of what politics are. So in this collection, in the cartographer, there, um, there are a few poems, kind of a sequence within the sequence called Place Names. And it's always a place in Jamaica that, and I'm fascinated by the name. Uh, here's the idea behind that sequence. If in a country like my own country, um, that the it's a history of colonialism, it's a history of enslavement, uh, it's a history of people not being allowed to read or write. And so when you tell that story, um, how do you find that history? <clears throat> yeah, when you tell that story, how do you find that history? And I, I realize that sometimes people hide their histories in strange places and you have to be sensitive enough um, to listen to that and to find it there and i found that place names were a place where history was often recorded I, i'll tell you about one one of the other point but i guess the place name poems come from a larger project and a larger idea that i have about what poetry does um, because the, the place name poems look like um, look like definitions. So I've been fascinated by this for a long time. Uh, poems that look like definitions, that look as if you've looked in um, a dictionary or you know an encyclopedia, and this is the entry that you find. And I guess at the heart of it, I think that good poetry always always exposes the world as being insufficiently defined. Um, it, it takes something and it says that that definition that you, that you had of it, uh, this way of seeing it, it was always insufficient and the poem therefore expands our way of knowing the world. Um, and so, so from the beginning I was writing poems that again <clears throat> looked like dictionary definitions. Uh, and, and, and there's some great poems like that. Um, Robert Pinsky's shirt, which just says, you know, this, this, this object that you thought was so ordinary, let me fold in all kinds of histories and, um, you know, stories. Let me take you all over the world to, sh to tell you what is involved in the making of this shirt. And so these poems, these place name poems, they, they, they probably come they're, prop they're a part of that larger project, um, which is probably something I, I, I tell all my students. Um, if, if you've come to the end of the poem and it does not expose the world or the thing that you are thinking of as 
being insufficient in the way that we saw it before, then probably you haven't come to the end of the poem yet. Probably you haven't done all that you can with the poem. Uh, probably one of the more interesting poems that I wrote um, in that sequence uh, was a poem called um, Place Name Oraka Bessa. And I'll tell, tell you, read the poem in a second. Uh, but uh, uh, I was asked to write this poem for um, an exhibit at Buckingham Palace. So they'd taken out all of their gold and they wanted a poem to celebrate the end of this exhibition. Uh, and probably it was a risky poem to read in that setting. Um, but again, I wanted to go back to Jamaica and our own history with gold. Um, and what that, yeah, what stories are hidden in the naming of, of one place in Jamaica. So I'll, I'll, I'll read the poem. Or I'll remember the poem. <clears throat> place name, Oraka Beso. Origins disputed, but most likely leave over from the Spanish, Ora Cabeza, golden head, though what gold was here, other than light glinting off the bay, other than bananas bursting out from red flowers, though this too is disputed, not the flowers, but the origin of bananas. They may have come here with Columbus on a ship which in 1502 slipped into Aracabesa the way grief sometimes slips into a room. In those days, a sailor tried to name the island Santa Maria, as if not knowing we already had a name in another language, a language whose speakers would soon all die, though this too is disputed, not the deaths, but the completeness of genocide. For consider, if you will, such leave over words as hurricane, consider barbecue, consider Jamaica, land of wood and water, of wood and water, but not of gold. Could someone please go back in time and tell Columbus in Taino there is no words. In Taino there are no words for gold. Christopher Columbus, in Italiano Cristoforo Colombo, in Espanol Cristobal Colon. A teacher once told me Colon is root word for colonist, and though I know that was false etymology, there is some truth to it. Aracabessa, at which place you might find such tranquil villas as Golden Ridge, Golden Cloud, Golden Eye, long time home of Ian Fleming, who sat there on Cliff's Edge, the morning's breakfast brought to him by a woman named Doris, the scent of ackee and crisp fried breadfruit wafting up to his nostrils, while between his teeth he bit a number two pencil, all the time looking out to sea as if fishing for a story, maybe a man. An incredible man, let's call him Bond. James Bond, who knew 007 wasn't actually Scottish, but a barefoot boy from St. Mary, Jamaica. Like so many others, he too migrated the brutish winter, cooling his complexion down to white. Such stories, gold finger, golden eye, the man with a golden gun. Did you never stop to wonder where all this gold came from? Did you never stop to ask? What was found in El Dorado? Well, let me tell you, not a nugget, not an ounce of ore, but light gilding the bay and perhaps bananas and perhaps ackee and such language as could summon wind to capsize Columbus's ships. And if that's not gold, then what is? Yeah. I think if you... I think we have so much to offer to poetry. Um, again, especially if if you bring an experience that is away from the center. If you if you come from a place that you you have access to other sounds that we don't usually hear in in poetry. If you have access to words and languages that we don't often hear, that you you have so much to offer to how we write po to how to how poetry is written and how poetry is heard. Um, but you can't do that with a kind of preciousness. I mean, you have to craft those sounds into being. You have to, you have to be careful with how, um, how those sounds are presented to the world. But I think it's, um, I really think I'm lucky to have come from where I come from, to have access to those things. And so, I, you know, I, I think a, a course like this is, is, is tremendous to encourage people to bring those sounds 
into being and into life and into poetry. Um, and I wish you all the best um, with your work doing that.